Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our school committee meeting Wednesday, December 13th, 2023 at 7.30. Please note we are videotaping as well as live streaming on our YouTube channel, and the recordings will be available on our YouTube channel. At this time, would you please rise and join me in the pleasure of the meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'd like to introduce our school committee members and administration in attendance. On my left, Mr. Dan Marino, uh, Mrs. Uh, Davenport, Mrs. Angel, Mrs. Martelli, um, and Mr. Powers, superintendent. And on my right, uh, Danny Chops, um, student advisor, Mrs. King, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Fitzgibbon, Mr. Chair, and myself, um, the chair. Um, we also have in attendance um, Ms. Liz Berry, Ms. Tola Babaloa, um, Mr. Schatz, and Ms. Judy McDougall, the recording secretary. Um, at this time, um, I will move on to correspondence and recognition. Mrs. King. Um, Mrs. Connor Laferto, um, I would like to make a motion to take item 9, Educational Report, Student Advisory Council, out of order. Um, Second. Just because of the time, we have a lot of conflicts with the students. Sure. Second. A motion to be made by Mr. Uh, Mrs. King and second by Mr. Dolan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any discussion? Motion passes. Thank you so much. I appreciate that um, to the committee. Um, so I'd like to introduce the Student Advisory Council. Um, we did meet, so they do meet twice a month um, before school. I did meet, meet with them um, last week on Wednesday morning before school. Um, because we're in the middle of budget process right now, um, I did start talking to them. We usually kind of talk about random topics that might be pertinent to them. So we did start talking about the budget process, just so, you know, of the three things that we are in charge of, that's one of the biggest ones, and especially as we start the budget cycle. Um, so we did start talking about the budget process, what that looks like, um, how we start that with the superintendent and where the funding comes. So hopefully the next couple of meetings I have with them will kind of talk through that um, so they get a better sense of um, the budget process. And I would like to first introduce um, their president, who is with me today, Danny Schatz. Good evening, everyone. On Wednesday, December 6th, the debate team traveled to Old Rochester High School to compete in our first debate meet of the season. VR had four teams that competed against surrounding areas uh, schools in the area such as Totten High, Bishop Fian, Foxborough High, and many more. There were 27 varsity teams, which included students who had debated in previous years, and 27 novice teams, which meant it was the students' first time debating. We're so happy to see that newcomers are exploring their interest in debate, and we are so excited to start this new season. For the rest of the month, NHS will be holding their annual Toys for Tots drives, Collection boxes will be in every classroom and students are encouraged to donate as much as they can. Collection will end December 19th so that our toys can be sent to Santa in time. Nolan cannot be here tonight so I'll also be reading his blurb. Um, so today he wanted to mention a few holiday events put on at our school. As he talked about last meeting on Saturday, December 2nd, the National Honor Society hosted Breakfast with Santa event. The fundraiser went incredibly well and it was a blast for both the volunteers and the families that participated. We had about 100 families show up, which was a nice surprise since the event had not been around for many years. As well, this past Saturday, December 9th, VR hosted our annual Key Tree event. Students around the school were given three Key Tree dollars, which they could exchange for presents in Miss Kendall's room. The Key Tree event gives students the opportunity to buy presents for their families if they could not before. This year, the Key Tree was opened up to all schools within the district, a huge step for growing the fundraiser in the future. Both of these events are helping our community get in the holiday spirit. Thank you and happy holidays. students attended to take part in this conversation. This club has been running since the beginning of last school year. 
and since then the group has continued to grow exponentially. The average number of students in attendance was about 60, but this past month the number was considerably higher. This event is open to all students and takes place during the school day in order to remove barriers that may prevent students from attending. During each session, two students lead the discussion on a specific topic related to social justice to start the conversation. The topic of the conversation this past month was cultural appropriation, leading to a large amount of student involvement. This has been welcoming and a friendly space for students to speak on topics they're passionate about and hopefully find ways to create change within our schools. The next meeting will take place on December 18th, and I am so excited to hear of the outlook of the convention. Thank you so much. And um, Quinn could also not make it today, so I'm going to be talking about his blurb. Um, he's talking about SpongeBob the Musical. On Saturday, November 18th, at 2 o'clock p.m. and 7 p.m., the Rainwater Players put on their fall show, SpongeBob the Musical, and the performance was a huge success. There was a good amount of people in attendance for each show, with younger kids enjoying the show at the earlier time. There were laughs in the audience, and that they were very entertained by the plot of the musical and how each actor executed their role while on stage. At the end of the show, the cast sang a theme song to SpongeBob while calling younger people to the front of the auditorium to sing and dance with them. Overall, the Rainwater Players put on another phenomenal show and allowed for people of all ages to have so much fun while seeing them. Thank you so much and happy holidays for me. And now let's welcome Sophie. Superintendent Powers and School Committee. Recently, TJ Squared held its annual auction to raise money for our 2024 season. Our members were able to sell many tickets and raise quite a bit of money from the raffle and silent auction that we held. We were very grateful to everyone who came and supported us. Winter sports has also started back up, including basketball, gymnastics, ice hockey, indoor track and field, swimming, and wrestling. They will all be ending at the end of February. Thank you, and this concludes our report. <coughs> Seniors are also anxiously waiting um, early dishes, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. King, and thank you for everyone showing up to me. Thank you for bearing with us for starting a little bit late. Um, next, I will move into um, the reports on um, community emails and correspondence. Um, and I received an email um, about the great job our staff did um, helping with the Frosty Mar Half Marathon in Reno. Emails encouraging, encouraging staff, student, and community surveys. Email from a parent hopeful about some of the administration changes within um, the special education department. Also advocating for appropriate budget to support special education students. Email looking for additional funding positions within the music department. Emails advocating for next year's budget to support smaller class sizes. And emails from parents concerned about the migrant students moving into the district. And at this point in time, um, I, as the chair of the school committee, would like to make a statement about the uh, migrant families moving into the district. Um, I know there has been a lot of talk about the migrant families being placed in Raynham and what the town, school, etc., can do just to level set. To qualify for assistance, at least one member of the family must be a citizen, a non-citizen with a green card, meaning they are admitted for permanent residence or a non-citizen permanently residing under the color of the law, which often means that the resident has applied for asylum within the U.S., meaning they are in this country legally. The families that are being placed in Raynham are being done so through the mass shelter system. These are families known to the state and the federal government. Most have temporary protected status because they are fle fleeing violence in Haiti and Venezuela. Just to make you aware of some additional background, Massachusetts has a 40-year-old right to shelter law, the only state in the country that requires emergency shelter be provided to homeless families. In October, the governor sought court intervention to cap the limits, and that was approved. In addition, the town of Greenham has no authority to interfere with a private hotel owner and his or her renting rooms to the Commonwealth. The McKinney-Vento Homeless Act ensures homeless children and youth have equal access to the same free and appropriate public education, including a public preschool education as provided to other children and youth. Furthermore, federal law provides newcomer students with the right to a free public education. Specifically, the U.S. Supreme Court 1982 Fire versus Doe 
decision affirmed the constitutional right of free education for all youth regardless of citizenship status. In accordance with federal and state law, BR Regional School District will, enroll, will work to enroll migrant youth in the school district. The state is providing educational aid to communities hosting homeless families at approximately $104 a day per pupil. In addition, DESE has committed to reimburse school districts incurring significantly higher than usual homeless student transportation costs with reimbursement. There has also been questions about vaccination status of youth. In accordance with the federal McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, schools must immediate enroll, immediately enroll students who are homeless regardless of whether they require vaccination documentation. However, given that these youth are coming from other hotels within the state of Massachusetts, we are hopeful we will be able to obtain up-to-date vaccination records. In closing, I too share some of the concerns I've heard from people over the last week, concerns about adequate resources, staffing, etc., in our schools that are already stretched. Even with that, I ask you as adults, I ask you to give pause to reacting out of fear, uncertainty, and frustration. Much of this is out of our control um, and out of control of migrant youth. As I was an Uber driver for my children and their friends this past weekend, I heard conversations between kids that gave me pause. They were talking about what their parents were saying about the migrants. Our kids listen to our words, and I am asking you to please think about what you're saying and modeling for your children about acceptance. My hope is that as a small community, we rise up and welcome these families and their children and show them compassion and acceptance. These children have experienced things that most of us could never imagine. The trauma and transition they have experienced is unfathomable. If you want to be heard about this, you should contact your state delegation as well as your congressman, senator, and the governor's office. Thank you. At this time, I will move um, into public comment. The school committee welcomes uh, information, concerns, and opinions from those attending the meeting. In order to give those wishing an opportunity to speak, ensure compliance with open meeting law and other legal obligations and avoid disruption of the meeting. The committee, uh, sorry, the committee will not engage with the speaker or with uh, one another in deliberation on comments as they are presented during uh, comment periods. It is the discretion, at the discretion, the committee may schedule issues raised by a speaker for deliberation at future meetings. If you would like a personal response, please email the committee or Mr. Powers during the meeting. The chair will now open up public comment for a period of 12 minutes per policy VEDH and would ask anyone who wishes to speak to please approach the podium, provide your name and address, and, respect, and I respectfully ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes. When your three minutes is up and you have still not finished, I ask you to submit your thoughts or script to our reporting secretary, Ms. McDougall, and she will distribute them to the committee peer review. Um, is there anyone signed up, Ms. McDougall, for public comment? No. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Um, at this point, um, I will uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved, second. Uh, motion made by Mr. Dole and second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All the, any discussion? Uh, there's a point of information, no discussion on consent agenda. Uh, Just vote. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. At this point, we will move into the administration and school committee reports. Mr. Powell. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. Um, would you like me to stay here, Madam Chair, and go up to the podium? I'm happy to go up to the podium, sure. <clears throat> Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, members of the administrative team, and guests in the audience. Um, I did want to provide uh, three quick updates. Uh, one, uh, the first is, well, not a quick one, but the first one is uh, around the migrant families and students. Um, I want to uh, certainly just echo a lot of what Ms. Um, Comrade Labarento said, as well as what was said last night at the uh, Rainham Board of uh, Select Meeting. Um, <coughs> I, you know, obviously received several correspondences over the uh, weekend since Friday. Uh, many were uh, very supportive, uh, offering assistance. Uh, what can they do for these families? Do they need you know, basic needs, necessities? Uh, to, you know, can we buy Christmas presents? To a local pediatrician reaching out, offering health services. Uh, obviously, I received uh, several emails in regards to uh, questions around vaccination status um, and just the overall process. So I did want to provide some clarifying information. I certainly tried to get back to everybody that emailed me with as 
with the information that I know, um, and you know, information has since uh, started to come in since then. So, just a, a few points of clarification. Uh, as we know that uh, this was not a decision of the district uh, nor the town, it really was a decision of the state uh, and the home to suites. Uh, what we know is that hotels across the Commonwealth can apply uh, to be part of this emergency assistance program, the emergency shelter program. Uh, they don't need permission from the district, they don't need permission from the towns. It really is an agreement between the uh, state and the hotel. That being said, uh, you know, we on a daily basis welcome families from all around the world. Uh, we have uh, and we will continue to do so. Uh, each day when our doors open, every child that walks in brings something special and unique, regardless of where they were born, whether it be Bridgewater or Rainham, a neighboring community, or if they moved here from some of the countries that we see, uh, some of our students coming from Egypt, India, the Philippines, Pakistan, and Holland, just to name a few. Uh, these students, uh, the students are about to enter our system are no different. Uh, we have no reason to believe that they're going to take any resources or any support away from any of our current students. Just, and, you know, in fact, just the opposite. We believe they're going to uh, bring a lot to our district and enhance our already wonderful school system that we have. Uh, as I did say, the information has been somewhat slow to come in from the state. However, it is starting to uh, come in even as we speak. I uh, received information yesterday and some more information today, and I know the town of Rainham as well. Uh, the town of Rainham is in contact with housing and livable communities, what we refer to as HLC. So that's where they're getting their information from. We're obviously getting our information from DESI. Uh, these organizations appear to be communicating behind the scenes, or at least we hope they do. Uh, so that way, when the town gets information and we get information, it's uh, you know fairly similar, which to date ha has been, for the most part, uh, pretty accurate what they have and what we have, with you know some small uh, discrepancies here or there. Um, what I was uh, shared with today is that by tomorrow morning, I should have a complete list of, of the students that will be relocated to the home to suites in Rainham. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact number yet. Uh, that will obviously be part of the uh, list of students that I receive. However, what I was informed of today is that we should anticipate 78 families uh, being re relocated to the home to suites, which is fairly consistent with the original number that we were provided of 75. Uh, as you know, home to suites can accommodate 84 or has 84 rooms, um, and so we know we're you know pretty close to the max at that hotel. Uh, but we anticipate 78 families being relocated from across the south coast in the Cape. Uh, and, and again, we should have all that information hopefully uh, tomorrow uh, or even maybe tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, those moves are anticipated to happen next week and the week after. Uh, we are targeting as a district, depending on when those moves actually happen of having these students start school on January 2nd. We will certainly be doing outreach to them as they, uh, as they are relocated and move into the home to suites, uh, but that is our target start date for those students. Obviously, we'll adjust that if need be, if for some reason there's a, there's a delay in the move, uh, but that's what we uh, do believe at this time. Uh, because these families have been, have been in the emergency assistance program for some time, uh, we were um, told and assured that they are coming with resources, uh, and you know, not just uh, resources in terms of basic necessities, but resources in terms of state programs. Uh, we also know that Department of Public Health has been working with these families to obtain their vaccinations. Uh, as uh, the chair uh, shared with you, under the McKinney-Vento Act, uh, uh, vaccinations are not required for them to enroll in school. They are, however, required. These students will be required, just like all of our other students, to obtain their vaccinations. Uh, but DPH has been working with them. What we were shared today is because these families and students have been in the state for a number of months already, that some of the students are fully vaccinated or in the process of being fully vaccinated. So it's a you know, little different situation than just a family uh, arri arriving newly to the country uh, because these families have been here for some time. And even you know, in the country's origin, they were, they were able to provide documentation that they've been vaccinated. So, we, uh, we, we are hopeful that that will, uh, process will go very smoothly. Uh, obviously, we've been working as an administrative team for uh, you know, the past uh, few weeks to make sure that we are fully prepared. Until we know the numbers, we want 100% be able to uh, you know, execute our plan. Uh, but I just want to kind of share with you some high level information around what we have been talking about and what we have planned. Obviously, uh, you know, a lot of this is depend dependent on the number of students uh, that do enroll. Uh, so along those lines, we are prepared, if necessary, to add additional staff, whether that be um, school adjustment or some type of counseling staff, as, as the chair shared. Uh, we know that some of these families have experienced trauma on their way, and we want to be able to make sure that we are supporting them. Uh, again, depending on the number and the needs, uh, we may need to add additional classroom staff 
or additional uh, special education staff, support staff, ESP, proctor, uh, even health services, our nursing department. So again, once we have a better sense, um, as uh, the chair did share, there are, uh, there are some funding mechanisms available to us uh, to help offset those costs. Uh, there is some reimbursement per student that's $104 per day. Uh, right now, what we know from the state is that there will really be two payment windows. One is happening now for those students that were in the district, uh, in or in a district in the fall, and there'll be another one later on in the school year. There are a few grant opportunities for us to apply for upfront uh, assistance, and so we'll certainly, once we have a better sense of numbers, uh, be looking and exploring those as well. Uh, we've obviously been working closely with Mr. Mussini and uh, the transportation team. Uh, we've already identified several uh, buses that are in that general area that can accommodate uh, students. However, obviously we know that if there's uh, you know, a larger number of students, we may have to add additional buses or vans. But again, as the chair shared, there's, there's more funding out there available if we should incur a higher than expected cost. Uh, we have a plan to enroll uh, these students. Obviously, because they're already enrolled in a school system, uh, somewhere else we're going to be getting a lot of their records and information from those sending schools. So it won't necessarily be uh, a cumbers as cumbersome as, as sometimes it can be, uh, but Ms. Uh, Cohan and her team are ready to actually enroll those students and register them on site. And much of what we talked about initially is um, you know, heading over to the home to suites uh, to welcome and greet these families and students and obviously start the process. Uh, as well as Ms. Brennan and, and the health services team, uh, they've already been uh, reaching out to DPH. Uh, they'll start reaching out to the sending schools to uh, review health and wellness uh, <coughs> needs and records. And uh, as I stated already, we already had a local pediatrician's office uh, reach out offering any type of assistance and support that they could provide to the students and families. Uh, Ms. Moore, our coordinator of family and student supports, um, again, has been uh, working on securing basic necessities, um, anything from toiletries to uh, securing gift cards for food, uh, gift cards for uh, clothing if necessary. We have also um, several agencies in the area that work with families in need, uh, and so uh, they have also provided assistance and, and reassurance that they are willing to support not just our current students, but any future students as well. And I think what you'll see is a common theme here. All these supports are available to our students no matter uh, where they're from. Again, whether they've been in the school system for years or they're, they're new to us, all of these supports are, are things that we you know, routinely provide all of our students. Uh, Mr. Kilgore is working with his department to ensure our spaces are set up if for some reason we need additional furniture at a particular school because we have higher enrollment. So he's working on, on that as well as Mr. Schantz. Uh, as you know, depending on the grade level, we do have a one-to-one -one technology program, so making sure that uh, these students are not at a, at a disadvantage when they arrive. Uh, Mr. Schantz and his team will be providing the Chromebooks. Uh, and as well, uh, and again, this is open to any family, uh, Mr. Schantz has secured a grant, as you know, as he shared, uh, for hus uh, hotspots and internet access. So if any family is in need, I would anticipate Home to Suites providing Wi-Fi access, but for some strange reason, they do not. Uh, we obviously have that as well. And then lastly, our principals. Uh, they have been hard at work uh, trying to uh, plan different welcoming activities, whether it be at the hotel uh, when these families arrive, or um, at their schools, whether it be over vacation, prior to vacation, after vacation, uh, and obviously, you know, we'll know more once we know the exact number. But uh, I'm confident that uh, what we have already talked about and put in place, uh, we will be able to execute. And um, I, I think it's you know going to be an opportunity for us that'll in the long run uh, really be beneficial. So that's an overview of your family students updates. Happy to answer any questions about that before I go into track and tennis sports and then our principal and school improvement plans. Well, Um, I certainly keep you aware, of, of course, of, of those activities, absolutely. Any other questions? Other questions? Yes. So in regards to the $104 a day, that is all reimbursement, right? So we have a school district, we are upfronting that cost. Now, I know, like in the past, when we talk about like the transportation costs, and you guys are saying, oh, this is the first year that they actually paid all they were supposed to, like how confident are we that we're going to get reimbursed from the state? Uh, so for the... Uh, 100%, well, nothing is ever 100%, but close to 100% confident that we will get that $104 per day. Um, I know just in reading correspondences with other districts, like they're in the process of processing those payments now. Okay. So I would think that there's no reason to believe that that money wouldn't be available in the spring. 
um, in terms of transportation. Um, they have never 100% committed to uh, uh, you know, fully funding when we talk about regional transportation. Uh, and they've always, they've always been careful of their words. This is, they're pretty certain uh, in saying that we will reimburse you for higher than expected uh, homeless transportation costs. So I, I do feel as though that uh, what they're telling us is going to be accurate. Okay, and then um, another quick question in regards to just like teachers, right? Like, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously like our students, our community, but you know, this is obviously a more, you know, more on our teachers as well. And I know if we have to hire more staff, so. I don't know if there's any resources for our teachers as well. And I'm not saying, and like another point, I know I've already had this kind of conversation through email with you, Ryan, and it's not that we're not welcoming, but we're always talking about our budgets, our constraints now, and how we can't do more, but now we are going to do more. Um, so how are we, like, are we like giving any like support for our teachers? I know we might be hiring, but this is also so I, I definitely think it comes down to, and, and I won't 100% be able to answer that question, Ms. Davenport, really, until I know the numbers of students. Uh, we've heard from other communities uh, in similar situations where they've had, you know, uh, I think the number was 30 families, uh, you know, uh, be relocated to their community, and it only uh, translated to five students. So you know, we're anticipating when we hear 70 families. I think, in, you know, myself included, I'm thinking at least one student per family, maybe multiple. Um, students per family, uh, but that may not be the reality. Uh, we know that, you know, obviously these families have to have uh, a child uh, to be part of this assistance program, but what we're hearing from other communities is sometimes they're, they're newborns and they're infants and they haven't started school yet. So it may not be, it may not have the impact I think that we're all uh, possibly anticipating. But certainly, uh, you know, we are aware that, um, although I don't, I, you know, depending on the number, I'm not sure of the uh, real impact or burden it'll put on our staff, um, and so we, we certainly try to support our staff on a daily basis and make everything available to them, uh, and we'll certainly continue to do so. Um, you know, we're obviously looking at, you know, <coughs> supporting our students first, but, you know, to your point, we want to make sure our adults feel supported as well. I, I think once we have a better sense of concrete numbers, and they tell me they're going to send it uh, to me tonight, but that I, I won't hold my breath on or stay up too late, um, I, I think we'll have a, we'll be able to wrap and then one more thing. So, like, um, in regards to like having the impact, like there won't be any impact to our like our current students. But any time away from our current student for an additional student is time away from our current student. So I'm glad you're confident about it. I, I think I'm just share like I share some concerns of our like community in that aspect mm -hmm. because as it is, I feel like we're already stretched. Mr. Powers, you had uh, <clears throat> mentioned that they would reimburse for any uh, that the state calls unexpected transportation costs. Now, uh, we're, we're in December, our transportation costs are really set. It's pretty set. Did they give any guidance on what they meant by unexpected transportation costs? Is it one bus, two bus, additional route? So I, they, they haven't given necessarily that clarification to that level of detail. I think what they're anticipating, obviously, is these families, depending on um, you know their location that they're coming from, the, the school that they're enrolled in, will have the opportunity to stay at their what referred to as their sending school. Um, so you know I think we really anticipate right now the reimbursement coming along those lines. If if we um, do have to transport, uh, and obviously we'd be cost sharing with the sending district, um, transport a large number of students back to their sending district. I think you know what they're initially sharing is after that reimbursement. Um, I think certainly, you know, we'd have to explore the option of, uh, you know, adding a big school bus if, if we need to, and we can't absorb the number of students on regular, our regularly scheduled buses uh, to see if that's an option to be reimbursed as well. And just out of curiosity, and I, know, I know we don't know how many uh, students we may get. It's still kind of speculative, but worst case scenario, kind of as to go along with what you're, you're saying here, you said, said we need families. Maybe one or two children into uh, the district. Uh, from the sounds of it, they're mostly entry age kids. The schools at Liberty in Merrill are stretched thin. It's the, what are uh, the administration's plans for if the worst case scenario happens 
and, we have, and then not staying at their other uh, school districts, what's the plan? Mm -hmm. Sure, good question. So I, I think obviously we would, uh, you know, our plan right now, like any new student uh, enrolls, we, we certainly always start with, okay, what, what classroom do we have space in? Um, and then I think, you know, we, um, uh, you know, split the students up that way. Uh, obviously there's, you know, depending on needs, we'll somewhat determine placement. You know, for example, if there's a student on an IEP, that placement is already kind of predetermined. And so uh, we won't necessarily have too much flexibility there. Uh, but I think, you know, we'll obviously, um, you know, try to look at class size already established so that, you know, if we have 10 students per grade level per se, the plan wouldn't be to add all 10 students to one. Um, you know, if it's a bridge, if we're talking about the Bridgewater side, that would be one per classroom. Right hand side is seven. So, you know, one and a quarter of a student, uh, you know, we'd be placing in a classroom. You know, it's not uncommon we look at enrollment, I mean, already even from the beginning of the year. Um, you know, we're adding students on a daily basis and, you know, we've been able to, you know, absorb uh, those students and, and their needs. So again, I, I think it, you know, when we talk about potentially 78 plus students, if that's really the number we're gonna go on and spread across 12 grade levels, um, I, I think, you know, we'll be able to handle that. Um, I do think to your earlier point, if it is all elementary, then that puts a little bit more of a strain on some of our classes. Um, you know, I think obviously when we talk about adding additional staff, uh, the one thing I'm always hesitant to do is to uh, disrupt or displace a student in the middle of the year. So if you know, we were to add another classroom teacher, um, I'd be hesitant to then you know, call you up to say I'm moving Lou, I'm moving Grace, middle of the year, they've already had those relationships established. It may be a case of that's, and these are all what ifs, if that was the case, we didn't need to add an additional teacher to lower, lower class size, it may be reaching out to parents, anybody willing to you know, move their child in a year. And we had that happen during uh, COVID, it wasn't ideal, but some families volunteered uh, to do that. Or it could be a case that we look at how, can, how else can we support if we do add an additional classroom teacher, maybe it's not another home room, but it's a way to provide additional support for that grade level. So I think you know, we really, we, we have kind of a couple different scenarios in mind, um, obviously numbers depend. It's for uh, the shelter system, uh, the family shelter system is for um, individuals with children. It is also um, available for individuals that are pregnant. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, individuals may have no children but be expecting. Yes. Um, so there is a range of individuals um, that possibly could be coming to um, to uh, bring them. So thank you, Mr. Powers. Um, my only other two updates, uh, one is around the track and tennis courts, and I'll share this information with the community in the buzz this Friday. Uh, we have a new <coughs> update. Uh, most of the uh, work on the actual track surface and the tennis court surface has halted for uh, the season, just given the temperatures. Uh, but what you will see is uh, crews out there working on the site. So they're still um, you know, moving uh, uh, you know, gravel around. They're still digging some uh, ir irrigation trenches um, or drainage trenches. So you'll still see crews up there working as long as they possibly can, and even throughout the winter. You know, there's um, some new, uh, there's a new flagpole coming. That's something that they can uh, actually, you know, put in during the winter. Uh, the scoreboard was taken down while they were constructing it, constructing the track, so a new scoreboard will be going up. They'll be able to uh, put that in during the winter. So you'll still see work happening. Uh, if you've been by, they are in the process of putting up the fence. Uh, the posts have been up there for a, a you know, few weeks or a number of weeks and, and months now, <coughs> but they're actually in the process of putting the fence up. So. Uh, Mr. Kilgore and I have talked, once those fences are complete and the gates are up, we will more than likely uh, lock those for the winter just to try to keep anybody off there. We don't certainly don't want the damage to the track or tennis court surface. And then once we, uh, spring comes, uh, hopefully we get some great weather early on. Uh, as we've already talked about, it really needs to be 50 and above. Um, and, you know, I think ideally, uh, if it's even warmer than that, then obviously the material uh, cures quicker. Um, if not, then, you know, it may be longer. I know the tennis court, they're saying they'll need about five days, um, you know, start to finish. The track, they're saying um, there's a lot of prep work that will go into that. So believe it or not, they actually spray the material uh, down on the track surface, and they actually need to, like you would do at your house, uh, you know, tape off anything that's not gonna be sprayed, because uh, they don't want that material to be on the fence or on any of the, uh, you know, storage sheds and so forth. So they will have to do a lot of taping and prep work on the uh, site before they can actually apply that. But once they do it, it should be a multi-day project. 
uh, to actually spray that surface down. But ideally, it will be <coughs> weather dependent. So our hope is we'll be able to have a, a track meet and a tennis match uh, in the spring. Uh, that's our best case scenario. If for some reason weather doesn't cooperate, then you know they may not be open until later, later in the spring, uh, early summer. Uh, but we're we're excited. I would encourage you if you haven't been through there. Obviously, it's tough to see anything now at night, but if you can get through during the daylight hours. It's it's pretty impressive. Uh, and lastly, uh, I know uh, everyone is so anxious to hear from our principals uh, who have joined us tonight. Uh, Ms. Watson and Ms. Charette were able to come to the last meeting to give a quick overview of the school improvement, uh, their school improvement plans. And we have several principals here this evening uh, that uh, I'm going to invite to come down and do the same. Uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, review the process. Obviously, school improvement plans are developed at the uh, site level where their school improvement councils. We obviously ask those plans to uh, be linked and coordinated with what we're doing at the district level. Uh, so uh, again, you'll see a lot of commonalities and similarities. However, each individual school applies, uh, you know, the, those 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 practices to their individual needs. Uh, so the their school improvement plans will mirror and look very similar to what our student success plan looks like, as it should. Uh, but individual activities will be more specific to each individual site. Those plans are obviously submitted to the superintendent's office for my approval uh, and then shared with the school committee, which is what we did at the last meeting and which we'll do tonight. So what we've asked the principals to do, like we did last time, is just to pick one or two items uh, just to highlight and share with you uh, to give you a quick overview, but you obviously have those plans uh, in your drive as well. So I'll ask our four principals uh, to come on down and share the stage and give a quick overview.
those are the highlights of our school improvement plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Powers. I am honored to be before you tonight to highlight some of the important educational and social emotional improvements we are working towards accomplishment at the Bridgewater Middle School. For those who do not know me, I am Tim Califf. I am the proud principal of the Bridgewater Middle School. Before I begin, I want to recognize the members of our school council who helped to build our school improvement plan, our parent representatives, Becky Moore, who is our school council co-chair, Stephanie Flaherty, and our teacher representatives, Denise Ricardo and Katie Nichols. Our school improvement plan is based on the district student success plan and tailored to the needs that are present at the Bridgewater Middle School. Rather than reading through the entirety of the plan, I will highlight some of the school action items as it relates to our four pillars of the district student success plan. The safe and supportive schools. The Bridgewater Middle School is currently in the third year of the DESE Social Emotional Academy. Working collaboratively with our guidance department, we developed the BBS and PBIS matrix with common expectations and language for the school. We created a student action committee and implemented a school-wide positive behavior reinforcement program, which kicked off in November with Spartans Helping Hands. I want to thank Heather Costa, one of our school psychologists who started the creation of the PBIS matrix and who regularly shares insight as we move to a more PBIS environment at the Bridgewater Middle School. In addition to the above, BMS has revamped our child find process that includes the collection of intervention-based academic data, curriculum instruction and assessment. We are in our second year of implementation of high-quality curriculums in ELA with EL Education, math with Envisions, and science with Open Science across all three grade levels at the middle school. All three of these new curriculums integrate a social-emotional learning component, which includes student discourse, collaboration, cooperation, and project-based learning. We continue to provide professional development to staff around the curriculums at the district and school-based levels. It's our goal to develop more focused data teams to continue to analyze iReady and MCAS data to assist in identifying content standards that require additional resources and support to improve student outcomes for all students. We continue, for operations, we continue to work with the district to prepare and replace our school security cameras, identify space in the building for additional academic support outside the classroom environment, we are planning to assess the current operational knowledge of our instructional <laughs> operational knowledge of instructional technology among staff, so additional PD can be determined to support the staff in its use. For human capital, I am very thankful that over the past two years, in this current school year, um, to have an interventionist working with our students <coughs> to bridge the gaps in learning created by the recent pandemic. The interventionist has a positive impact on assisting students working to be at grade level in mathematics and ELA. We will continue to advocate to maintain an interventionist at the Bridgewater Middle School. In addition, we will continue to provide quality professional development opportunities in content areas, DEI, social emotional learning to support the staff. And finally, it is our goal to continue to develop wellness programs, recognition, and support for our staff. This concludes my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the School Committee, Mr. Powers. Uh, my name is Matthew Clark. I'm the principal of the Williams School. I'm here to present our school improvement plan. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my council members. Our council strove to intertwine uh, the district's goals with ones that were site-specific to the Williams campus. Here are some of our highlights. Under safe and supportive schools, uh, we're looking to create a new student and family welcome team. The goal of this team would be to focus on communicating with new families and students beyond the registration process. Once a student starts the new school year, uh, it's easy for a family to get lost and not know where to find the correct resources. We would prefer to reach out to them first before they decide to reach out to social media. Uh, we're also looking to, con to continue to work with the district's SEL coordinator, Kendra Rose, on our PDS, PDIS initiatives. Under curriculum, instruction, and assessment, we were focused on the continued implementation of the district's new curriculum Wit and Wisdom, EL Education, and Envision Map. By using tools like the early literacy screening and data from iReady, we'll be able to support student-specific needs. Under the Operations uh, Action Plan, it's important that all of our different building-based teams, such as our crisis and health and wellness groups, know and are able to execute their roles. 
We're also looking to do an outdoor space review to see what improvements can be made for our students' enjoyment. Finally, under human capital, our goal was to promote a healthy st staff through relationships within the building forged through faculty meeting team building activities, <coughs> the new teacher mentor program, and by promoting all of the programs available to staff, such as care solves. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and Superintendent Powers. My name is Dennis Bray, the principal of the Mitchell. The Mitchell Elementary School Improvement Plan, like everyone else, is aligned with the district student success plan. This plan was developed with assistance from school administrators, staff, families, and a member of the community. So I would like to thank the members of the Mitchell School Council who worked on the creation of this plan. Retired Fire Chief Michael McDermott, community rep and school council co-chair. Mrs. Anna Caleb, parent, Mrs. Kelly Dwyer, parent, Mrs. Nikki Littlefield, staff member, and Ms. Kathleen McFadson, staff member. As you know, the district student success plan, which drives the school improvement plan, is built upon the four pillars that everyone touched upon, safe and supportive schools, curriculum instruction and assessment, operations, and human capital. Like everyone else, although we have many school-based action plans, I would like to just share several highlights. Under safe and supportive schools, we are focused on expanding our school-wide PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention Support Initiatives. This goal will be accomplished by working with our PBIS committee, <coughs> CL coordinator Kendra Rose, and the entire staff at Mitchell. Under curriculum instruction and assessment, we are focused on implementing with fidelity our new math program, Envisions. We are monitoring curriculum pacing, utilizing our math coach and STEM coordinator, Kara Joyce, to support teachers in conducting grade level meetings along with district PD to assist with implementation. We are also using iReady data in the area of mathematics to monitor student growth and progress towards year-end standards. Under operations, we are focused on improving the overall safety of everyone at school by creating a MERT medical emergency response team, which is led by our school nurse, in these meetings, we discuss and develop protocols and procedures for responding to medical emergencies and receive training from the school nurse as needed. And finally, under human capital, we are focused on developing and implementing strategies to make our staff meetings more meaningful and productive for staff. We are attempting to increase the amount of time <coughs> staff spends collaborating with one another to plan lessons, discuss best practices, and analyze student data instead of just a presentation from administration. The meetings are more focused on student outcomes. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.
year as well, the fuel expenses will be monitoring as well um, for that. Um, we also did discuss um, Chapter 70 funding and anticipation for next year. Um, moving on, we did look at utility lines, which is also something on page 9 that we always discuss and watch um, to see um, going into the winter how the heating is going to be. Um, so we will keep on track as well, depending on January and February. Um, on page 12, we also did look at tuition for out of district. Um, that line item does get covered by circuit breaker funds, uh, but we do keep track of that as well. Um, after we did finish that, we went on to discussion and preparation of the fiscal year 25 budget. Um, as we know, Mr. Powers and his administration team is working on next year's budget. We're in the middle of the budget cycle. Um, preliminarily, he has met with almost all of his um, principals to get a sense of that, what they'll be asking for for next year's budget. Um, what we have been doing as a practice is he will meet with his administrators and principals, get a sense from every building um, what they need for next year. Um, he will take those incorporate that into his budget um, for the district as well as all of our buildings. Um, we have asked Mr. Powers to do kind of two budgets. We want a full budget of everything. In a perfect world, what does all of his, what do all of his buildings need? What does every, what does Bridgewater Middle need? What does Merrill need? They all have different needs. They all have different populations. Um, we do want to know, maybe we can't get those things in each budget, but we want it on record what they need at their school level. So it's something that we do have to take into account for ongoing budgets. Um, bearing that in mind, he will then also try to prioritize. He has been in discussions with the towns. Um, at the time of budget, he had spoken to Rankin to tentatively see where their head was going into next year. Um, they have given us a tentative number of potentially a 1% increase over last year. Um, which we'll see if that's what they end up with. Um, I don't know if he has met with Bridgewater, or are you doing that next week? Uh, we're in the process of scheduling that day to run a couple of days. So so more to come um, with that as well. Um, so we did talk about different cost drivers um, that Mr. Powers told us regarding health insurance, which is always a, a cost driver for the next year's budget with increases. Um, Health insurance, utilities, we did enter into recently a new gas and electric contract, which will increase next year, so that will also be a cost driver for the next fiscal year contract. Transportation, as I stated, with full fuel costs, um, we will have to take that into account for next year. Um, and we are also in contract negotiations with um, our bargaining units as well. So, all of those things we need to kind of take into account, um, and also bearing in mind that ESSER funds will end at the end of this, this school year as well. Um, so we talked about that. Um, timeline of fiscal year budget preparation. Mr. Powers is working on that right now. We have a next budget meeting on January 8th. At that time, he'll present his tentative preliminary <coughs> budget at that time to discuss, and that will be brought to the full committee at the January meeting. Um, something else that we did discuss, um, as I stated, we did have people um, attend our meeting <coughs> from the Music Boosters. They've been vocal that they, they definitely want to make sure that we have discussions and we know that there's a need at the high school level um, for music class. Um, make sure that's something that they want us to know about. Um, we had many, many parents contact us regarding class sizes, so that's also something that parents want us to look into. Um, and we had a lengthy discussion about class size, which I totally agree with. Um, however, we also have to look at the logistics of that, especially on the Rainham side, which we've touched on before. Spacing is an issue in the Rainham schools and elementary. Um, <coughs> so even if we had funding for additional teachers to lower class size, um, we don't necessarily have the space. So that's also something that we need to look into and talk about regarding class size as well. Um, um, Mr. Powers also 
touched on different programs that he's looking for for next year, um, looking at making sure special education is looked at. Are we um, in compliance? Are we also, what are the caseloads for everyone as well? So that's something we also have to take into account. Um, because we were short on time and we had negotiations, we did not get to the other items on the agenda. Those will be put to the January agenda. Um, he did give a track and tennis update tonight for me, so that is um, all set. Um, the only other item that we did touch on, um, capital projects. Um, Mr. Powers did give an update um, to Bridgewater um, regarding cap the status of capital projects. Um, so if they wanted anything more specific, we will get back in touch with them. Um, and we approved the November 13th, 2023 minutes. So we did not have any action items, just more updates regarding budget. Um, and then, we, like I said, on January 8th, we'll get the preliminary budget, and then that will come to the full committee on January 24th. Our meeting begins yes. the last week. Yes. And that concludes my report. Anyone has questions? Questions for the student? <clears throat> not so much a question, but more a has been on the migrant situation, but there's two 40B projects in Radium, 138, not 44. Actually, three of them in the process right now. Yeah. So, think, taking that into <coughs> consideration, it's probably time to start having some hard discussions with the town of Radium about uh, the schools, <coughs> because those projects are going to bring in school age children. I agree. My, Mr. Powers and I did discuss it, that we did talk about, I know Brandham has, we have the election in April, we have town meeting in May. Um, there has been some talk from the town that potentially the debt exclusion may go back on. Um, I don't know if that'll happen, it depends what the selectmen do with that. Um, if the debt exclusion for the BP project goes back out for a vote at the election in April, they might be in a better fiscal place at that time, they might be more of an appetite to talk about another school. Irregardless, I told Mr. Powers, we do have to discuss it, um, because even with the Mitchell project, that was an emergency and it took seven, seven years. years. So, and I have had meetings with Mrs. Riley and talked to her that it is something that we need to figure out. I know BP has been their major thing they're trying to figure out, um, so we haven't pushed it, but in the next couple of months, we need to have to I have a question. Um, when looking at the monthly budget report, do, do, do we have a spending rate target? I saw that in the last column, you know, some things are overspent and some are under, but when we look at the entire thing, like trying to understand where we are as far as a, a target rate for spending. I believe we are. <coughs> We are currently in the data phase but because at this point we are not yet uh, facing the winter to be able to uh, put us in a stage where we will be um, looking around to see what the winter will look like or how it will hit the budget. But at this point, compared to last year, we are in the range that are supposed to be. And if, do we have a number, like what that range is? I don't have that number on top of my head, but I can get it to you. And do we have that kind of target rate each month? Or no. If, if I may, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Babalola, it's not a monthly budget we really go by, it's a yearly budget. So we do look at it monthly to make sure we're keeping on track, but it's a yearly budget. So bottom line, we still have, like, 13 million on the bottom line. So we're still well within our budget, right. but we monthly make sure that all of our, we're not, we're keeping on track. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just trying to understand like what number are you using to know that you are on track? Can I, can I shot? Sure. So Ms. Mayville, um, if you look on those budget reports, right, 
a lot of um, <clears throat> the money looks like it's already either paid or encumbered. Like all the teachers' salaries, it, it's 100% pretty much paid or encumbered because we know we're going to pay that coming out. The things we don't know and that we're kind of monitoring all the time are those kind of what I might call one twelfth or one tenth expenses where you've got substitute teachers. So we know we're running a little bit heavy there with, as, as Ms. King said, uh, <clears throat> you know, we won't really understand uh, fuel till we go through the winter. So we're watching that as we start to enter the winter. So I guess to answer your question, it's those things that are really controllable and not say personnel related or anything like that because we know we're gonna pay our people. And so we're gonna just put it in the bank and say we gotta pay them. But, you know, and that's why, that's why Ms. Bell Lola and, and the superintendent freeze the budget every October. It's like, you, unless you have a really good reason for spending, we're not gonna say yes. And so then that creates the accountability to be able to uh, manage those manageable expenses to a level where, okay, now we're pretty sure we're gonna hit out. I mean, last year when we had B&D with a couple million, right? Yeah, a couple, a couple million dollars in, that we could put to E&D. So it's kind of that process to make sure we're running to a point where we can we can run it a little bit of a surplus so that we can flip it over to next year because we flipped like 2.2 million from last year essentially into this year's budget so that we could do more things and cover some of the things the town did. So long-winded answer to say we look at the controllables and we've already put away for the um, knowns. We don't have a spending rate target. <laughs> I, I would say, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is be, because, so like salaries are an annual thing, and so we set all those aside and we encumber those. <coughs> it's not a monthly target that we go because some months may be higher in expenditures than other months, but, but we have budgeted all of the, again, the controllable costs and then there are variable costs. So I, I would say we have a, a monthly target. We, we do not take the budget and divide it over 12 months. We, we could never operate that way um, for a lot of reasons. One, at the beginning of the year, we do purchasing of equipment, supplies, the whole bit. In the winter, we have the heating, the electrical, all of those costs go up. Um, but to Tim's point, we have the, the knowns every month. So our payroll, we know every month what that's going to be, with the exception of the, uh, the substitute late line. Uh, so no, we do not do a, uh, a budget divided by 12. But that would be just one methodology to get to the target. It doesn't necessarily mean that when you look for a target that it would be evenly divided over 12 months. In some cases, if you're looking for a target <coughs> and you know that in the winter months it will be higher, and the target for that month will be higher based on the past. So it just sounds to me that we don't have a spending target. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. And I, I, if I could, if, I would never advocate that we put one in place. Um, I think that's why we do a year-over-year -year look at where we, as Ms. Barbarola said, we are right within where we were last year and the year before that, we, we look at that as our as our target, if you will. Are we overspending from the year prior? Are we underspending? And when you look at it and say, okay, why? Why are we under overspending? Underspending? We, we like underspending. <laughs> but over if we get to the overspending, why are we overspending? What lines are causing us to overspend from the previous year? So yeah, I don't know if we if I would certainly never recommend uh, to look at a month, a month to month like that. But that's just me. Yeah. So
so the reason why it came up for me in this meeting, we've referenced Brockton several times, and one that that was one of the, the systems that they put into place was to have a target and to show the community um, where they are on a month-to-month -month basis. So I, I wasn't advocating for one, but it was a, a process that they put into place to address um, the issue that they had and to prevent it from moving forward. And I think that's a, that's actually a great idea that maybe we can take back to the budget committee is to say, <clears throat> how can we communicate out that we are on target other than just waving our hands? And and if we can do that in a more formal way. <laughs> well, no, I mean. <laughs> but I think we do that. Yeah, no, no, no. But just to be able to, uh, obviously, Ms. Mayville isn't quite there on board with us, so we're not doing a good job as a budget committee, myself included, uh, communicating to her what, why we feel we're okay. So we just hone it down and make it, you know, so that everybody feels like, yeah, you know what you're doing. That's all. Any other questions? No? Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Dan Marino. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on December 6th, <coughs> the policy subcommittee met in the superintendent's conference room. Uh, in attendance were myself, Ms. Ms. Mayville, Ms. Davenport, Mr. Powers, and Ms. Sotis. Did I say that right, Pat? Oh, <laughs> there we go. Improvement every month. Um, the first item <clears throat> is a, on the agenda is a carryover. We have the first read of policy IGA IGB curriculum development and adoption. Motion's been made by Mr. Dan Marino, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. So we have a read. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Madam Chair. With that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, changes to the IGA, IGD, curriculum development and adoption policy. Second. Well, second for discussion. Was there a second? Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Uh, motion to be made by Mr. Dan Marino and second by Mrs. Davenport. Um, discussion. And Mr. Dan Marino, if you could just highlight the key elements of, of the policy so folks at home understand. Yes. So the, the key elements to the uh, policy, we wanted to make sure that uh, the superintendent would have the authority to approve the new instructional programs, materials, uh, courses of study, as we've seen over the course of the past uh, several months, to make sure that uh, the process of that's going, uh, that we've been doing is correctly reflected in our policy. Uh, we put in language that you know, we, as a committee, uh, expect that uh, professional staff, teachers, administration regularly evaluate those items, and if we're then not up to snuff, we can uh, find something that will help improve our students, um, and that we, as the committee, will rely on the experts, the professional staff, teachers, administration, to design bring forward instructional programs that are going to be a benefit to our students. And also uh, that we will receive reports uh, on changes that are under uh, consideration for the administration. Thank you. Any other questions? All those uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, about the second read of policy CDB. This was created uh, by the policy uh, subcommittee for recruitment and selection of superintendent. I'd like to make a motion to read the second read. Second. Motion to be made by Mr. Damarino, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Madam Chair.
Chair. Uh, I'd now like to make a motion to approve and adopt C policy CBD recruitment and selection of superintendent. Second. Motion to be made by Mr. Damarino, second by Ms. Uh, Davenport. Um, any discussion? Mr. Fitzgibbons. I, I'd just like to thank the policy committee for taking my suggestion. After the process of hiring Mr. Powers and committing to writing how, we, how we're going to approach things in the future, I really appreciate that. And I think it'll make for a stronger ability for the entire district moving forward. So kudos to the committee. Much appreciated. Any other comments or questions? I just wanted to just add that I did share concern with the subcommittee that the policy doesn't currently speak to the interim or acting superintendent. That is something that did come up in community conversations um, before I was elected and was wanting to add um, language around that, um, but didn't make it. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Just going to take a vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the, during our uh, subcommittee meeting this month, we did review uh, a couple of other policies, GBEBC, gifts to and solicitations by staff, kindly as this uh, discusses uh, conflicts of interest and our uh, staff receiving gifts. Um, so uh, we reviewed it, it has been included in our policy that follows the ethics uh, that staff cannot receive uh, dollars. Um, this comes up and it was discussed about uh, holiday gifts as well as clarification as to uh, uh, fund me uh, counts as well as teachers helping teachers and several other uh, crowdsourcing uh, items which has been addressed and uh, Mr. Powers has indicated that uh, our staff is fully versed in the conflict of interest and what can and cannot be done. Uh, in view of this, the policy committee felt that uh, <coughs> it was reviewed and revised several years ago by the policy subcommittee and this committee still good and took no action on it. Uh, we also looked at policy KCD, gifts and contributions. Uh, MASC had made changes to their suggested uh, policy, so we took a look at ours, and again, we felt that ours went well beyond what MASC had suggested, and we elected to leave it alone. We did have further discussion about policy IMG, animals in schools. Uh, again, we want to make sure that uh, we are not violating any EPA uh, or any other disability laws. We voted again to table that just to make sure that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's as we do not want to subject the district to any unnecessary liability. We also voted uh, to uh, create the new flyer approval and distribution in the schools. Uh, we had a good uh, session regarding that with some examples of other policies. Uh, we did uh, table it so that the administration can take a look into exactly what is being requested to be distributed throughout the schools, uh, and we'll take it back up policy subcommittee meeting, uh, which will be uh, January 17th. Uh, the time will be determined uh, if there will be a long-range subcommittee meeting. If there is not, it will be at 530. And that is my report. Thank you, Mr. Dan Marino. Um, next is Community Liaisons, um, this is uh, Mainville, Mr. Fitzgibbon. I'll defer to Ms. Mainville. Uh, 
this month I received communication via phone call, Facebook, in person, and an email. A total of four parents and one student um, reached out. One parent of a child in the Bridgewater Preschool program expressed dissatisfaction with the IEP process and staffing levels. They allege errors in the assessment process and refusal to acknowledge their concerns. They were forced to reject the IEP and request an independent evaluation. Um, they are hopeful that the new, I'm sorry, my children are Two parents reached out inquiring if the public can attend the budget subcommittee meeting and if public comment was allowed. One, a student shared their positive experience with the high school indicating that she feels heard and seen there by school staff and principal who are aware of their challenges and often reach out to check in. She compared her current experience with her middle school experience and provided suggestions for improvement. And then one parent expressed her frustration with the communication between her and the SPED program, she indicated that she often does need to get responses to her emails and the protocols in place for assessment. Um, as a result, she has filed a complaint with DESE and is receiving their support. Um, and I also um, had some correspondence um, in my absence in November, so you'll see that in the report. That's all. Mr. Um, we've touched on most of it. I, I'd just say that I had several folks reach out to me asking about the migrant situation and suggesting we develop an FAQ for the district so that folks had real information to go to and not rumors and innuendo and make sure everybody was level set on the same thing. I think your opening statement uh, today, Madam Chair, was spot on to something that could develop into an FAQ, same thing with Mr. Powers' statement in his uh, su superintendent's report. And, you know, it's okay to say we don't know or more information to come in these things and, and update it regularly. I mean, I'm sure Mr. Dolan can tell you how good of a, how, how good an FAQ page is if you go to build a building. <laughs> um, so that, that, was, that was just all I heard, so just throwing that out there. Madam Chair, if I could, just as a sort of uh, a word of advice to all of us, that I think it's something we should all sort of keep in mind when we hear from folks, is that we hear them out, absolutely, I'm not saying we don't, but we should be sending those folks to the proper administration with whatever uh, concern they have, whether it's special education, whether it's a school principal, whatever it is, people need to be going to the administration as well. So it's it's important that we as school committee, hear, yes, hear them out, but also then filter them to the correct place, wherever that correct place is. So I just want to sort of put that out there for everybody. Thank you, Mr. Um, next on the ILA agenda is Mrs. Mealy's Council Report. Um, at 
this point, I will entertain a motion to approve the payroll, payroll warrants dated November 16th, 2023, November 30th, 2023. So, so moved. Second. Uh, motion made by Mr. Dan Reno and second by Mrs. King. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Come back. <laughs> Um, at this point, we will move into public comment. Anyone here for public comment before I leave? No? Once? Twice? No. Nope. Moving on. Um, at this time, I will ask um, any, um, any other announcements. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you again. At this time, I entertain a motion for adjournment at 8.50. So moved. Um, Motion to be made by Mrs. Fitzgibbons and second by Mrs. Uh, Martellus. Martellus, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>